Hi, everybody. Francesca Maxime here with the follow-up to the Embodied Anti-Racism webinar that we did on Wednesday, October 14th. And a lot of you had some questions that I wasn't able to get to. And so I thought that I would try to take a moment to um, answer some of them now and also let you know that the class starts very soon october 21st at worldwideweb.therapywisdom.com i hope that you can uh, come and take the class and um, really just answer more of these questions live uh, or ask i should say more of these questions live with me so we had over 2300 people sign up for the webinar which was amazing and <clears throat> 600 people or so on the live call from all over the country all over the world and everybody was really enthusiastic about naming their indigenous and native territory that they were on and so i'm ha so happy about that and there were people from all walks of life we had lawyers from germany and we had you know social workers in idaho and and therapists in new york city and um folks who are community organizers down in um South America and in Brazil. And we just really had a whole beautiful wide range of people from different modalities like brain spotting and internal family systems and somatic experiencing, and also psychoanalysts and also people who are uh, not directly therapists, teachers, uh, folks who were just doing something intergenerational intergenerationally with their own family. Um, there was a mother, uh, husband, uh, daughter, or a grandmother, mother, daughter trio, I think, um, that was in there also. So just a beautiful sense of community. I have sent uh, a variety of, of, of resources along with this email that I hope that you get. And um, there are some links in there. Uh, there's also <clears throat> a thing I wanted to say about when I say BIPOC in the webinar, uh, it was called out that I didn't explain what that is and I apologize. That's black indigenous people of color. It's often used as a term um, in much the same way that in the UK, you'll hear Susan Cousins talk about when she's the guest lecturer in the class uh, about black and minority ethnic or BAME. It's the acronym that they use there. And BIPOC can be a little bit problematic um, and, and so can BAME. And um, there's also, you'll hear people say AAPI, which is Asian American Pacific Islander. And there's other acronyms sometimes that come up like Latinx, L-A-T-I-N-X, if you're not familiar with that, which um, can refer to anyone in the, Latino, Latina, Hispanic, um, Spanish, diaspora, but that's a whole additional piece, but just to sort of give a little bit of a framework for some of the terms that maybe I didn't, I didn't fully explain uh, and assumed. The other thing is just about the terms of uh, whiteness or anti-racist or anti-racism or white body supremacy or white supremacy. I just wanted to say briefly that, of course, these are problematic terms and challenging. What we're talking about is systemic and structural oppression and how that's been perpetuated for years uh, based on a justification around skin color and all the implicit biases and mm, sort of you know, neurophysiological and neurobiological and intergenerational um, imprintings uh, that, that occur and then show up not only in our own individual bodies, but in policy, in practice, in our educational systems, in our court systems and things like that. And so there are folks who were sort of saying, oh, you know, it's not great to be sort of fake woke or to kind of call out the social work um, profession or whatnot, which is something I had mentioned on the call. It's not so much that that's not um, something that I you know, a profession. I mean, that's what I do. It's it's more that I think the origins around having it be coming from uh, folks who are wealthy, who are sort of like doing for as opposed to doing with, um, doesn't actually start to investigate the origins of the inequities and the inequalities. And so it's a question of, um, are we changing the system or are we sort of looking at this from a from an I mean mine perspective. So it's a both and, it's not an either or, we're looking macro, we're looking micro, we're looking meso, um, we're looking at all the different layers. Okay, so I'm gonna get right to it with some of these questions and see if I can run through them quickly. Can I speak to racialized intergenerational trauma for white and black bodies from Kaylin? Um, I, you know, speaking to that is essentially that it shows up differently in my view, in my experience. You will have, you know, clients will say to me things like, you know, as a black person, 
my white partner doesn't understand what it's like to never not have anxiety, to never not have had uh, the anxiety, the fear around walking down the street, or what is it like if I go to the gas station by myself in an area upstate that we're not familiar with, that, um, but she's not with me, and, and, and to have that kind of apprehension around um, skin color. And I think, that, I think that that's different from the way I think intergenerational trauma uh, lives in people who are white, in, you know, especially in the United States, when you are looking at all the different ways in which it's been systematized that we're sort of taught and shown that we don't need to be aware or shouldn't be aware of, of really what the inequity is. Because of housing practices like redlining, we only ever really saw white people. So then how are we ever going to say, well, I you know, don't have a black friend because I didn't grow up with a black friend. And then if I didn't grow up with a black friend, I don't have the experience of what it's like to actually see black people as relational and as my friends and as people that I have shared experiences with and so on and so on. And so over the years, I think that shows up as numbness, ignorance, defensiveness, you know, general dissociation. And then shame, like we talked about in the webinar, oftentimes for, for, for white bodies, uh, white people, uh, that's another term. I know we, we kind of unpacked a little bit in terms of bodies or, or not and why we use that term. Just a brief answer there on that. I'm just kind of going through these kind of quickly. How to integrate racism also, how each person in the conversation is embodying the racism along with ourselves in order to create greater safety in the conversation. I think what this question is getting at is if we're trying to have a conversation about unpacking inequity or racism, how do we self-investigate? And then also how do we kind of take in and integrate each person's social location and positionality and where we are in all of that? And again, you know, that chart that I used in the webinar, that social location chart is going to be sent to you. It's a sociological tool um, that, that you can find online, but I, I, I think it's really valuable. I think use that chart as a guide. You know, where are you? Where are they? What are they seeing that you wouldn't see? What are you seeing that they wouldn't see? Not making assumptions, but just knowing that if they have a different history, if they have a different social location and positionality, those terms are interchangeable, by the way, um, then that's going to mean that uh, you may not see the same things as the other person. And so I think in terms of creating a greater sense of safety, one of the things that I like to do, depending on the uh, context of the conversation you're having, is have ground rules. And some of the ground rules that I like are from a guy named Parker Palmer, P-A-L-M-E-R. Uh, he has something called Courage and Renewal Touchstones touchstones and they're kind of like the AA 12 step meeting you know rules like what you see here what you say here you know say here let it stay here or you know respect anonymity and things like that but they're not that severe so much it's more like you know listen with curiosity you know notice when you're feeling like you're always leaning in to have to talk or say something or come up with a solution what is it like to sit in the not knowing and things like that those are the kinds of things that I think help establish a sense of safety. There's also something called the Blackface Manifesto, Blackface Manifesto, which I thought was terrific. I, 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 uh, I saw that recently and it was amazing. And another um, group whose sort of rules of engagement, if you will, that I thought was great is Tada Hozumi, T-A-D-A Hozumi, H-O-Z-U-M-I, uh, Ritual as Justice School has a um, set of protocols, and I loved that as well as the Black Space Manifesto. So I'll try to include those also um, in this email if I can remember, but you can look them up if, uh, if you don't. But I think those are good guides. At, at the very least, you can use Parker Palmer's, Parker Palmer's Courage and Renewal Touchstones, and you can download those for free on the website, on his website. <clears throat> do you feel, another question, do you feel that as an anti-racist therapist, it's our duty to confront racism coming from clients in sessions? Yes, definitely. And will you discuss how to approach these situations in the classes? Yes, definitely. Thank you for that question. Uh, Marna, um, the previous question was from Mar. Yeah, Marna, for sure. I think that that's critical. And as a matter of fact, it's so interesting. I host a web online TV show called Inside Out on Wednesdays at noontime. 
And one of the topics of conversation uh, on one of these shows was just that. And, and you'll hear more about that from one of the guest lecturers in the class, Whiteness on the Couch author, Dr. Natasha Stovall, who talks about how she brings up not only whether or not there's racist beliefs coming from her clients, but if they're stuck in a system of, of what she sees as whiteness that, that she sort of brings attention to. But, um, but I think that the way you do it is important. It's invitational. It's with curiosity. It's not like you're being racist necessarily, but it's like, huh, what's coming up for me right now is a contraction in my throat, a sinking in my belly, a little bit of a, you know, um, leaning forward in my shoulders. And I'm noticing that I'm having the impulse to do some action here around what you just said. Because when I heard you say, oh, you know, the grocer, um, you know, in Harlem is, uh, is right to um, want to, because this is what someone said to me the other day, uh, you know, right to want to be super hyper vigilant uh, about black customers that come in for fear of stealing and, and things like that at the bodega, at the little grocery store. Um, but saying it in a more, you know, not, not quite as PC way, as I just said, uh, that, that the response might be something along, along the lines of, well, I'm curious what your experience with that is. Is there something that you could tell me more about, you know, you have you ever been in a, in a situation where, where you saw, um, something about that happening or did anyone that you know talk about that or things like that. So you can use it as a place to invite in curiosity, but certainly I think it's important to just sort of name it and also name your experience in it. And um, I think that that's part of what we're doing. We're, we're, we're being bold in the sense of we're not just letting things slide because there was a Korean American therapist that I did a TV show with uh, the Inside Out TV show. And she was talking about how when she would have her uh, Asian clients say things like that, she would not say anything because she thought that being a good therapist meant not saying anything and letting her clients just express themselves. And then when we did a little bit of education and work around that, and you can watch the show, I included it actually in, in the um, links that you're going to get but you can also find it on my YouTube page, which is just under Francesca Maxime. And the therapist's name is Lynn Min. She talks about how it was really a, a, like a, a light bulb moment for her that she could do just what you're talking about, which is to call out, call in, call into question, call into curiosity, uh, the way that you know she thought her clients were in fact being racist, but also that she was complicit in a way because she thought that it was her job as a therapist to just be a blank slate and not say anything at all. And how um, she's revisiting that with um, a nice, mindful and curious attention. Okay. When you prefer the racist part in you, when you refer, prefer, good Lord, when you refer to the racist part in you, are you also including an internalized racist part? Uh, that's from Rundeep. Yeah, I would think so. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by internalized racist part versus the racist part in you. I, the way I'm reading it is they're kind of the same. But if you listen to my podcast with um, Dick Schwartz, or if you take the class and you um, listen to the conversation that I had with uh, Dick Schwartz, founder of Internal Family Systems, he talks a lot about how all of our parts are to be respected and they wanna be understood and they wanna be unburdened. And so how do we unburden the racist part within the, that's internalized from its need to hold racist beliefs? And when we are beginning to do that, we can then allow there to be more space between our greater awareness or our self energy, as he says in internal family systems and um, allowing that part to, you know, to have some respect for the fact that it probably had to learn how to be that way in order, you know, to, to survive some kind of a, of a, a situation that was difficult for it at the time or was just pre-programmed in and it's never been investigated or interrogated. And now we can sort of bring it up to date and let it know that if it did come to believe that, then we can um, unburden it from, from that belief because it causes harm to itself and to others. And, um, and that we can then, you know, become more uh, in relationship with it because even Dick says, you know, 
his parts that are racist still come up or you know mine i know certainly do um but you work with them just like you work i work with the voice that tells me you know even though i'm sex positive even though i'm body positive even though i'm all these other things that like yeah maybe i need to lose some weight or maybe i you know so we still have the dialogue it's a question of often we still have the dialogue but it's a question of how we feel or, you know, when we are having that dialogue. Are we noticing, oh yeah, that's like what Jack Cornfield, who also is in the class, talks about when he says the top 10 tunes. He's like, you're gonna have some of the same sort of things pop up over time, but you just learn to just say, oh yeah, I bow to you. Yeah, gratitude, right. There was at one point in time, it was important for you to say this or whatever to me and thank you for that. And now I'm gonna go back to my you know, whatever it was that I was doing. And that's really embodied mindfulness or applied mindfulness, I should say, in action. That's what it really means to just, um, I think, notice your thoughts, but not be fused and merge with them. Let your loving awareness be the larger container so that you can, we can kind of process our experiences without drowning in them. Okay, this one is from Jill. How can we respond more mindfully to those who don't believe racism exists? Well, you know, my friend Lama Rod Owens, who's a Dharma teacher, says not everybody's going to be saved. So I think that, you know, we, again, one great antidote is meta, meta, meta practice, M-E-T-T-A practice, loving kindness practice. And the queen of that is Sharon Salzberg. And um, you can go to her website, SharonSalzberg.com, and read all of her books. Um, there are many. And it's basically this practice of, you know, may you be safe. May you be happy may you be healthy, may you be filled with joy and with ease. So if you're finding someone who is exhibiting racist behavior, racist thoughts, racist beliefs, and you're, you know, feeling like there's an impulse to sort of right the wrong or come back into balance or find greater balance, but yet at the same time, it's, it's either going to zap all your energy because there are some people that just aren't going to be convinced, or it's going to be a situation where you know, it might cause you severe harm and you're needed elsewhere in order to be able to move the needle where you can move it, that you can still do something with that energy. It's, you can still wish them well. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with joy and with ease. And um, it's said that Ram Das, the uh, who recently passed away, one of the teachers for um, my mentor, Jack Cornfield, um, and, and, you know, the author of Be Here Now and, and very much a, a spiritual guru in the last, what, 50 years? I don't know, a long time. Founder of SEVA, an organization that helped folks um, with uh, cataract surgery, with eye, you know, blindness. Um, I guess his altar used to have, you know, his enemies, so to speak, his uh, difficult people uh, on it also, not just his goddess, goddesses and gods and, and things like that, but the, the practice of loving kindness, the practice of love, the practice of acceptance, the widening um, and opening of the heart uh, was very much to include at that time anyway, the, as so the story goes, um, uh, I guess for him, again, this is not a political class, this is just an example, uh, Dick Cheney, who um, I guess in the throes of, you know, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, was presenting some challenges, but also worthy of being incorporated into that field of, of meta- uh, loving kindness and awareness. So you might want to try that with folks. Okay. Um, what will the end point look like when we live in balance to see ourselves in each other? If there's so much diversity and call for recognition of difference to 16, oh, to, to correct injustices, will it be continuous perpetual work? Sarah. Um, I mean, this is the whole point. Everything's emergent, we're process, and so we don't know what it's gonna look like. But the whole point is we shouldn't know because it's emergent, it's going to be something new. If we already knew what it was going to look like, then we're doing something wrong. We're supposed to not know what it looks like and then be comfortable with the emergence and the uncertainty around what it is that's coming up. Because if we always have to pre-know, if we're trying to pre-know, which is a lot of what our anxiety and our insecure attachment with ambivalent attachment and preoccupied attachment does, when we try to pre-know and fix and plan and all of that, we, we're taking away from what a new solution might be. 
which is why when you look at people like doing mutual aid, so sort of like equal exchange, like almost like a bartering kind of a situation, that those folks aren't working through formal structures and systems. They're creating a new kind of economy. When you looked at um, a teacher like Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote a wonderful book called The Body is Not an Apology. Sonia Renee Taylor, The Body is Not an Apology. Highly recommend it. Um, that you look at her sort of crowdsourcing a way to pay back her student debt and her student loans in a way that's completely open and, and generative. And she didn't come up with it. Somebody did this for her. They just sort of spontaneously did it. And people gave $10, $20, whatever it was. And all of that debt got wiped away. And that's part of what we're talking about when we're talking about rebalancing. Because she teaches a lot. She gives a lot of amazing free teachings away. And I respect her a ton. So I think that um, continuous perpetual work, I will say this about anti-racism work or whatever you want to call it, social justice work or, or you know, structural inequality, um, rebalancing work, um, that when I was working at a uh, group practice in Manhattan last year with a bunch of really established therapists, you know, folks who were some were former clergy, some are counselors, it was pretty much all white, you know, and I was starting to talk about these things. You know, one of the people there who was actually about my age, perhaps even a little bit younger than me, uh, who was married with kids was like, oh yeah, but that means we're going to have to do it like all the time, or it's going to be like, you know, if we feel like it in our spare time. And then I heard another really big, really well-known trauma therapist who founded a model say something like, oh, it's like having a second job. Well, here's the thing. It is like having a second job in a way until you get at least a baseline around what the real history is of the country, because otherwise we're never going to really understand what all the other folks who are non-white, if you're white, um, are dealing with, because we haven't yet really looked at and unpacked all the privilege that we have as white or light skin privileged people. And so, yes, it's going to be a commitment around that, just like unpacking the environment, just like unpacking, you know, our own very micro personal issues is, is going to take some unpacking, but it's worth it because once you get to baseline, then you're more open-minded around everything when, at least in my experience, when it comes to, uh, you know, sexual identity, gender, you know, equality, you, you're not so ableism and, and religious differences, like we're just not so easily triggered. So I would just use this maybe as a, as a portal to um, all of the sort of decolonizing our minds, right? Like that's the whole, there's a movement by Dr. Jennifer Milan called um, Decolonizing Therapy, and she's amazing also. I highly recommend. Okay. Um, my father is Colombian, nephews are Islamic and Senegalese. I look white, my in-laws are overtly racist, fundamentalist, Christian, conservative. How do you suggest I approach conversation with them? I want to open dialogue, but don't know how. They're very Midwestern, which feels hypocritical and infuriating. Help me address this. I don't know how to sit there. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of paraphrase the, and this is from Amy. I think I've heard, and I could be wrong, but I, I think I've heard my mentor, Dr. Jack Cornfield, talk about like, you know, just don't like be respectful, minimize the time spent, meaning don't overly engage. It's a little bit like the, the, the you know, the question uh, earlier asked, just be the healing yourself. Notice that the impulse comes from you. Wish them well, send them meta energy, loving kindness energy. May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be living with joy and ease. Because again, if they're not so unhappy or if they're not, you know, if their beliefs or thinking is, is less tight that way, then there's more happiness for them than there's more happiness for everyone. Um, be invitational, meaning just do you, do your own path of learning. Perhaps, you know, when they say, how are you doing? You know, you might say something like, oh, well, I'm taking this class. Um, I'm really enjoying it, whatever. And, you know, you don't need to invite further commentary on it, but you just might let them know. Yeah. When they say, you know, are you reading any book, good books lately? You might want to say, yeah, I just picked up um, How to Be Anti-Racist by Abram Kendi or something. And, and, and if they go off about it and they're really ultra conservative, um, just say, yeah, you know, I can really understand that, that that means a lot to you there. And um, and I respect that. But you don't have to take the bait. 
you know, you don't have to get so involved um, in that. Uh, all right, Riley, how do you navigate conversations about power and privilege with clients? And do you see that as part of the therapeutic work, especially when working with individuals who have not explored their own identities or biases? Yes, this is kind of the same question as before. And it's interesting, yesterday I was uh, partaking in a panel on reparations and it was really beautiful, the presentation on the case for reparations. And what they were talking about was um, one, of the, one of the people who's actually going to be in the class, um, Teresa, was saying that she uses whiteness as a lens that she discloses to her clients ahead of time to basically say, I'm going to be engaging in my therapeutic process with you through the lens of power, privilege, oppression, dissociation, numbness, whatever words it is. Those are my words, not her words. But she did say through the lens of whiteness when we're engaging. And hopefully um, that will serve as a, a way of looking at inequities, looking at power, looking at, you know, ignorance and unconscious and all these kinds of things. And um, she said, with the exception of like one client, I think she said she had 30 or 40 clients, you know, everybody was on board and that it was working. So, you know, that might be something to try, but I think um, I do see it as part of the therapeutic work, but I think the more work you do, uh, to regulate your own nervous system, to understand when you're getting triggered, to figure out, you know, what's happening with you. And then just the more you know, um, you don't have to like spill everything out right at once, but you can just say, yeah, well, you know, I didn't even know this because this is true. I didn't even know that black people were not allowed legally to testify against white people in the, in the justice system, that the courts literally did not even allow that legally. I just didn't know that. So imagine what that's like to a whole entire race or category of people. We think everyone has the same rights. We think that everybody, you know, has been free and has equal opportunity, but the legacy of that, that's something, right? So things like that can even be helpful sometime, from, from time to time. Lenore asks, I'm Latina and feel that racism works for labor exploitation. Do you relate racism with the economic system? Hello, Lenore, for the magic question, yes. Um, the economics begat racism. It didn't work the other way around. So because of the greed from the Portuguese slave traders in the 1400s, we ended up with a system around uh, basically asking Pope Nicholas uh, to then use the doctrine of discovery to say, hey, you know, go forth and conquer, do whatever you have to do to turn heathens into, you know, beautiful people. And um, this is all very well documented and, and being facetious uh, and paraphrasing heavily. But the point is, is that it was about money and it was always about using race in service to or racial division in service to um, justification really for uh, exploitation of labor. And you see that with farm workers, you see that with the work of like activists like, you know, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. And you see that with, um, you know, a lot of folks who've been fighting for economic rights with COVID, of course, frontline workers, and who's actually disproportionately affected by this. Black and brown communities, Hispanic, Latinx, you know, um, and black communities, uh, because, you know, who's out there actually delivering the groceries and, and, and doing the cleaning and, and all those kinds of things and more exposed to COVID. So, uh, I definitely say yes to that and, and we'll unpack more of that. <clears throat> I have a podcast coming up soon on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network with uh, Professor Ian Haney Lopez, Ian Haney Lopez. And he talks a lot about how the divide and conquer um, needs to be replaced with a unite and build philosophy, but that, that, that the economic um, greed, uh, which is very much a part of the core mindfulness, te you know, we call it the three poisons, uh, the Buddhist teachings of the three poisons of greed, hatred, and delusion or ignorance. Um, but that that greed, that economic greed, I have to have more in that whole dominant system that comes from that uh, structural, you know, racism, patriarchy, that whole thing uh, is, is it's, it's, not, it's not separate from economics and yet racism and, and economics are not exactly the same thing. But I think Ibrahim Kendi, uh, the author of uh, 
you know, so you want to be anti-racist or whatever it's called. Uh, I, I just said it earlier, but now it's escaping me. He said they're conjoined twins, conjoined twins. So I think that's a good way to think about it. All right, from Samantha, is there any instance where certain people's traumas need to be acknowledged apart from the we before the people or traumatized parts can be willing to be accepted or integrated into the we? And yes, 100%. In episode 37 of my rebooted podcast on Ron Doss's Be Here Now Network speaks to that. Uh, it's with Dr. Diane Goodman. And in that case, uh, she's a Jewish uh, anti-racism educator, and she's talking about how, you know, and I referred to this a little bit in the call, I think, on the live webinar, is that being, mar being persecuted on the one hand um, doesn't negate or isn't, you know, it's unique from, from the kinds of persecution that black people would have. So you have both kinds of trauma, intergenerational trauma, you have both kinds. And sometimes there's a, and her, her whole call was do your own trauma work, whatever that is. And that would be true if it's, um, you know, personal trauma, like, um, you know, abuse at home or neglect and, and all those kinds of things. So certainly I think you have to learn how to take care of your inner part so that you can become more empathetic. It's that, that's the portal. Otherwise we often feel like, you know, I don't want to say that we're, we feel like the victim, the survivor, um, that we can kind of, you know, we need to take care of that for as long as we need to take care of that, but to not use it as a, not that we would, but to not use it as an excuse, but to use it more as the portal to this helps me and it helps me open up to being more compassionate and feeling more connected and less separate. So I'm not so separate because I had suffered um, violations or neglect. I am more connected because I'm in the community of all these beautiful folks who have survived. And then through there, I can open up perhaps to doing further uh, anti-racism work or even just awareness so that as I show up in my day to day, I do enough education or I do enough um, trauma work so that I'm able to show up when it's necessary, whether it's a board meeting or the line at the grocery store or whatever it is in a place of awareness around the need to not have the silence as violence, um, but to actually be able to step in and, and, and call something out if necessary. Um, Susan asks how much of the training includes practicing somatic experiencing. Everything is always that. I mean, I'm speaking kind of quickly now, my, you know, a little bit hyper aroused. I'm noticing that my chest is a little bit tight. So I'm always regulating the somatic experiencing pieces will be pointed out as they were in the webinar. Like let's pause, take a look around, notice that where we are in space and time, if things are getting a little bit charged, um, that kind of thing. It is a somatically informed class. It's a nervous system regulation, polyvagal theory informed class. And so we'll be in, sort of learning how to be embodied as we go and maybe sort of offering little tools and tips if we're going through conversations and we're like, wow, I'm getting charged here. Ah, what does it mean to kind of slow down and breathe ourselves down and to stay in connection? Pause, titrate the experience. If you have to turn off the camera, come back, whatever it is you have to do or, you know, and then come back if you can. Um, that again, you have agency, you have agency. So um, I hope that's helpful. From Marion, uh, heartbroken about my experience. I really like this black woman professor. I went to speak to her next I know before I could even open my mouth. I'm being told that I'm a white oppressor. I never connected with her again. Too painful, but I still value her. How could I have dealt better with this? Well, you know, we don't know what other person's pains are exactly or what the history is there. And I certainly can't speak to that. I hear that you're heartbroken and I'm also recognizing that rather than necessarily, I mean, I don't know where you are in your anti-racism journey or, you know, in terms of the summary stages of racial identity development, which we'll unpack in the class and module three, I think it is, um, Dr. Janet Helms's work, also a podcast you can check out. 
on Ram Dass's Be Here Now Network and the Rerooted podcast. Um, I think sometimes we have to just acknowledge our disappointment and our loneliness around maybe we did something wrong, maybe we didn't. I don't know. One of the core mindfulness teachings is praise and blame, gain and loss, fame and disrepute, pleasure and pain. These are, you know, the 10,000 joys and sorrows in life. And so sometimes we're not going to be able to please all the people all the time. Um, this person may have had a bad experience with you previously that you don't know about, with your, you know, organization, uh, with people in your profession. And if there's a way that you can be open to hearing what that is, if that is a thing, um, and just listen, I think that would be valuable. If there's something that you want to do about it, I don't know. I think it's just sort of holding your own hurt and heartbrokenness and use that grief and use that heartbrokenness as, wow, there's some hurt there. And I want to take care of the baby of anger. I want to take care of the baby of grief. I want to take care of the baby of, um, of sadness and of longing for connection that I'm missing here because um, that's what Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen master, talks about when he talks about, you know, we want to take care of our feelings so that we, <laughs> one of my clients, she says, I don't give someone else my blob. <laughs> you know, you don't want to give this woman, even though you want to be in connection with her or want to feel like there's greater understanding, you don't want to give her, her your blob around that. You want to be able to learn how to kind of take care of it a little bit and, um, and then uh, continue to do this work. Uh, read the books, take the classes, and just practice the self-regulation and learn how to do distress and discomfort tolerance uh, around uh, emotions that aren't always happy, happy, joy, joy, but, but they're, they're fine. You know, they're fine. They're part of the human condition, just like old age, sickness, and death, just part of life, as the Buddha says. Okay. Um, Marion says, how do I get consent? I ask about appropriation. So when I was talking in the webinar about appreciation versus appropriation, you ask, you just ask, meaning you could ask it figuratively, or you could ask it literally. You could ask it sort of for example, I used a Tibetan singing bowl in my practice. And did I actually go ask anyone if I could use that because it is culturally appropriative? No. Did I ask for an ancestral blessing to say, in this context, am I going to be receiving or being allowed to receive the gift and the wisdom of the resonance of what this bowl has to bring and to share? And is it all right for me to use this as a transmission of vibrational energy from all of your wisdom onto everyone? You know, you can create your own ritual about it. So I think that there are times when you can directly ask, um, like there was a seminar that I was at recently in a trauma healing thing where I was making a point that the example they were using was um, about a white man who had almost been attacked by a shark and who was escaping from that. And that the trauma therapist who was also white and was in a white, a room of white people talking about this incident, that when the white clinician who was showing this demo was showing this, to what was a large percentage of uh, trauma students um, who were people of color, that there was nothing contextualized around what that example may or may not have been, like how it may or may not have landed for certain groups of people. And so I said in sort of a sidebar chat, you know, the shark in the water is kind of a, you know, if you're surfing in California and you're just like this cisgendered heterosexual white male as this example was, you're enjoying a certain amount of privilege at a certain level. I'm not sure if this is the best example without context for what it's like to feel threat. Because I feel like a lot of people who are people who are black and brown feel like there's a lot of sharks in the water, so to speak, on the sidewalks and, you know, hanging around the corner and things like that and yeah, as their neighbors. And this, you know, one of the clinicians had said, you know, I, I'm calling attention to that in the group. And I was like, well, you know, I'm a little bit offended that you didn't ask me to give you permission to mention that because it was something that I had said on a sidebar because she was thinking she was doing something good by bringing it up. And I think, 
when I then brought that up, she did actually say, I'm sorry, I didn't, you know, ask for permission. And, you know, this actually wasn't my idea. It was Francesca's idea. Anyway, I don't know if that really answers the question. It's probably too confusing as an example, but it basically was a woman of color noticing something that was weird about the example that wasn't contextualized that could be used as an example for polyvagal theory, nervous system regulation, and escape from threat could still be used, but to put it in context for this audience, um, if you're being culturally aware, and that, you know, my idea, my observation as a woman of color sort of looking at that and seeing that was then just plucked and then spoken out into, you know, the group as a white woman trying to help trying to do this, you know, be an, you know, anti-racist leader, which was then kind of offensive to me, not in a horrible way, but, you know, a little bit. And so then I walked it back and I mean, then she walked it back and she just said, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm learning. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. You know, we're all learning. We're all doing this um, together. And then I think this is the last question um, from Tom. How do you know when your own anti-racism work is done and you're ready to help others? I've worked on my own trauma and have done the traumatic trauma work myself, but I still yet sense resistance. I think what you're saying is internal resistance, Tom. Here's the thing. The whole idea about this is calling it the path to becoming an embodied anti-racist practitioner, person, human being. Anti-racism is code for loving, connected, sense of belonging, integrated, you know, all of that around not only racial issues, but around issues in general. So you just have a sense that like, you know what, you, you, it's a sense of forgiveness around, I'm going to mess up. It's okay. I've been traumatized. I know how to regulate myself. Gee, people are still going to say bad things about me or maybe do bad things to me sometimes. And I have privilege. I can hold both of those. I may have, um, work through a lot of my trauma, I can still get triggered. Do I criticize myself for that? Or do I hold myself in positive, warm self-regard? I am enough and I matter, noble and dignified, relaxed and alert. Here I am in the midst of it all, taking my seat with everyone here in community and on my learning journey. We're never done. You know, someone once explained it as a spiral. It's not a circle, which is sort of the wheel of samsara, you know, the sort of around and around we go. It's sort of a spiral where we're emergent. So it kind of gets bigger and it kind of gets wider as it goes. So it's always emergent, always expansive. So I would just say, it sounds like you've done some amazing, beautiful work. And I just encourage you to take the class. If you're not already enrolled, please join us and um, do more of the work uh, together. Cause it's, it's, we'll learn from each other. That's really the beauty of it all. Um, I think that's about it for now. So I just want to say, please join us for the Embodied Anti-Racism class, A Mindfulness Way for Helping Professionals, starting Wednesday, October 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We'll have five classes, live Q&A. Some people have asked, um, what does that include? And we'll pick a little topic of the day or start with a conversation, and then I'll open it up, and you can ask me more questions one-on-one. -on -one. And if any of you want to do any experiential work with me um, on the spot, then um, we're welcome to do that. I know we didn't get to do that in the webinar, although I had hoped we would. <sighs> Slowing down. Okay. This is the poem I said I might read, and so I'll read it. Stacked. They stacked black bodies into ships. The middle passage layered 20 million people plucked and purchased. The remainder, half of them lived. What remains is nuclear, whiteness, eternity's half-life. Two. They stacked black bodies into trucks, dozens outside the funeral home in Brooklyn during COVID. A thousand a day, brown and black people dying, I can't breathe, the weight of Eric Garner's words, portending George Floyd, bearing the weight of the knee, whiteness laid bare. Kaepernick takes a knee, un-American, which lives matter now? Three, black imprisoned men buried black bodies in the potter's field on New York's Hart Island. Hearts of a people, Geechee, North Sea Islands, Hilton Head, Gullah, West Africa, America. 
How many were thrown overboard for insurance money, still breathing? What unimaginable aches lie silent, groaning, bellowing the ocean's knowing? Ancestors. What claims sit silent, centered within whiteness, so quiet? Reckoning, remorse, reconciliation, so distant reparations. The cost of this passage, Amazonian, more than 13 billion collected by a single white man on one pandemic day. Our consumption insatiable, this particular appetite for privilege, defending manufactured liberties, whiteness's psychic abyss. Four, when will we own the horror? How will we take it in, digest it? To risk drowning in truth, arrest cooperation in the tacit complicity required of silence. These habituated ways of unseeing so stealthy, our refusal to plumb such depths as facile and relaxed as Derek Chauvin's demeanor. Our assignment, chiseling through, mining the layers of all that is complexed within us. This endeavor, our task, an unusually helpful fracking. Five, we keep our shadows held inside so tightly, clinging to their benefits as Southern bells clutch their pearls. These shadowy remains remain stacked so deep, so layered within our bowels, still moaning, each one with its own voice yearning to rise up still, each one relentless in its knocking, a persistent reminder, having, having preserved this sacred enthusiasm, both abundant and unsullied, these holy tremors await their ascension, ancestors forever eager to meet the light and sing. I wrote that about two months ago in the summer of 2020. So please join us for the class, worldwideweb.therapywisdom.com, my website, where you can find out more information about me and my anti-racism offerings that are free. Or um, if you ever wanted to hire me for a workshop or something, that's also something that people had asked about. Um, it's worldwideweb.maxime.com clarity.com. That's M-A-X-I, M like Mary, E like email, clarity, like clear seeing, C-L-A-R-I-T-Y.com. Thank you so much. I hope to see you Wednesday in the class. Take good care. Be well.